Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte Kilpatrick, reporting for Vaccine Nation at the World Vaccine Congress in Washington. I'm delighted that today we're joined by Dr. Christine stable Ben from the University of Southern Denmark. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Not at all. So just to kick us off, would you kindly introduce yourself and the role that you currently play? Yeah, so my name is Christine stable Ben. I'm a medical doctor and also a professor of global health at the University of Southern Denmark. My work is on vaccines, and I've been working on those for more than 30 years now. Most of my work takes place in Guinea-Bissau, a small country in West Africa. But we have also taken the findings from Guinea-Bissau and taken them back to Denmark and to the Nordic countries to test whether some of the effect of vaccines that we see in the African context are also relevant in high-income settings. Fantastic. That sounds fascinating to compare those different settings. So you are joining us for a session on the non-specific effects of vaccines. What do we mean by this term and what do we currently know about it? So this is a, a relatively new concept within vaccinology. So it's well known that vaccines induce the specific protective effects against the vaccine disease. And it's also well known that in rare uh, circumstances, they can have uh, severe uh, and serious adverse events and res responses, which can lead to, unfortunately, a few people uh, getting harmed from vaccines. But generally speaking, these are the two types of, of vaccine effects that have been looked for and which are part of the current understanding of vaccines um, throughout the, the history of vaccines, basically. But what we have uh, found out through studies in Africa in a setting with high infectious disease, mortality and morbidity, is that vaccines have effects on the risk of dying from infectious diseases that simply cannot be explained just based on their specific protective effect against the vaccine disease. So for instance, a vaccine like, like measles vaccine, when it was introduced in our community uh, in a naive uh, community where there were no other measles vaccinations, our group delivered the measles vaccines and they saw that just over the first year after the introduction of measles vaccine, mortality declined by 70%. So this was much more than explained from just the prevention of measles infection. And in fact, that observation was repeated in four other low-income settings that have data to compare mortality before and after the introduction of measles vaccine. And, and they consistently showed a more than 50% reduction in all-cause mortality after introducing measles vaccine. So this clearly couldn't be explained just by prevention of measles death, which were only like, you know, maybe 10% up to 15% of all death. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, in the best of situations, measles vaccine could, have, the introduction of measles vaccine could have reduced all cause mortality by those 10, 15% if it was 100% efficacious, all children got it, et cetera. But, but what happened was this incredibly large effect, which then led to the hypothesis that measles vaccine has these beneficial non-specific effects. It strengthened the general immune system and its ability to respond to a broad range of pathogens and basically acts as a, a shield towards dying from a lot of, of different infections. Fascinating, thank you for that insight. So um, now we've sort of got this idea, this hypothesis that you've mentioned, what are the sorts of trials or tests that we can be doing to better understand them? Perhaps your work is doing that. Yeah, so what we have been looking for is, after these observations, consistently going through all the routine vaccines that are in use and looking for their effect on overall mortality and morbidity. And since that's mainly due to infectious diseases, if this, this is really, you know, looking at their effect on, on the risk of dying from infections. And for all the vaccines we've studied, and that's 10 now, we have seen that they have these non-specific effects. So we basically cannot predict their effect on overall mortality and morbidity based on just the knowledge of, against the specific diseases. So as I said, for measles vaccine, we saw that it had these tremendous effect, and we've seen that both in the before after studies, but also comparing children who received and didn't receive measles vaccine, and uh, lastly, also in randomized trials. So wherever possible, we have taken these observations forward to randomized trials. And that is challenging, because when you're talking about routine vaccines, mm -hmm. You know, you have to think of designs where you don't deprive a child of a vaccine, but where you, and preferably also don't delay it. But I can give you an example with measles vaccine, because there we, we moved forward the age of measles vaccine to four months. So we gave, in a randomized trial, children measles vaccine at four and nine months, which is the, the current recommended age in, in low-income settings, or just the usual measles vaccine at nine months. So they, that gave us a window of opportunity to compare children who had and hadn't received measles vaccine by moving forward the age. Uh, so, so in that way, 
we have tried wherever possible to think about study uh, designs, way to manipulate the schedule for vaccines in ways which allow us for, for doing randomized comparisons. And largely these randomized trials have confirmed what we have seen in observational study studies, namely that the vaccines have these much larger effects on other diseases than, uh, than can be explained from the current understanding of vaccines. Amazing, that's so interesting. So you're also looking at it from the perspective of comparing different income or resource settings, and that's something you're discussing, I think, at the Congress here today. Can you explain a little bit more about this? Yeah, so what we saw these very strong effects of vaccines of, uh, on all-cause mortality uh, and through the effect on, on other infections, we of course asked ourselves, would that be relevant also in high-income settings? And there, fortunately, we cannot do studies on, on ch children's overall mortality because it's so low. So we basically needed to have enormous studies if we were to study if a, a given vaccine would affect children's risk of, of, of dying. Uh, but what we have looked at uh, as a marker of infectious disease susceptibility is the risk of getting hospitalized with infectious diseases. And, and interestingly, since we are in the US, I can tell you that there was a group from CDC picking up also on these findings, which tested in the US context, um, there are more than 300,000 US children, uh, and whether they had a live attenuated vaccine as their most recent vaccine, or a non-live vaccine as their most recent vaccine, because the pattern we have seen in Africa is that the live vaccines confer this additional beneficial effect against uh, all pathogens. And here in the US, they saw that in, in, in the relevant age group, children, depending on whether they had a live or a non-live vaccine uh, as their most recent vaccine, had a very different uh, risk of getting hospitalized for infectious diseases. So those that had a live vaccine as their most recent vaccine had a 50% lower risk of getting hospitalized for any infection uh, in, in the follow-up period. So it looks as if we can corroborate these effects of vaccines on the immune system, this, in, 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 this immune training um, from the live uh, attenuated vaccines, that, that's, that seems to work across the world so far. Wow, that's fascinating. So you're clearly bringing something very exciting to the Congress to share with your colleagues. What are you looking forward to for your time here, or what are you hoping to take away? So I hope to get more people aware of these non-specific effects because they are currently not very well understood or well known, mm. I should say. Uh, we, we understand a lot about them. We also now understand the neurological mechanisms. So I think we're very far, but, but the whole system for both designing vaccination programs and also for, for testing and approving and regulating vaccines, they haven't adopted these findings. So I really, I'm here to create awareness about our findings, to talk with a lot of colleagues, to share our findings with them, and of course also uh, hopefully learn new uh, things. But what I feel I do here is bring a new perspective, which is, uh, I can feel sometimes maybe not really, uh, there isn't a lot of room for it. I came from a session right now where they talked about adjuvants, and, and the whole concept about adjuvants is about getting such a, uh, high enough immune response to a given vaccine. But since I work on all-cause mortality and look at these broader effects of vaccines, I all the time ask myself, can't help asking myself in such a session, so who has ever shown that it's good to have a highest possible uh, immune response to a given vaccine? There is some competition in the immune system. And there is actually no study, to my knowledge, that has ever shown that a high antibody response to a given vaccine translates into better overall health. So it might be you might be slightly better protected against inf getting infected from that specific infection, but it doesn't really help you if it doesn't translate into better overall health. So, so you can see I can sit there in that session, which is where, where the whole focus is on a completely different outcome than the one that I actually think is most important. So in that sense, it's, a, it's fun, it's challenging to be in a setting with a new kind of knowledge or a different kind of knowledge and see how it plays into or comes into play with uh, the, the existing knowledge. Wonderful. Well, I hope it's a really productive time for you and thank you so much for joining us.